Uh, David, should we, uh, we ready? Let's go. Sure, let's hit it. All right. All right. Let me sh oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, so I just kind of want to reintroduce that like, again, we're going to, we're all going to be, uh, we're going to be talking about pollen today. Uh, this is a UI toolkit built at Bambi. Um, that they've open source recently and it looks super, super cool. And to see John and David who worked on the project actually talk us through, um, you know, how do you build a UI toolkit? How do you think about it? And then kind of the practical code we can actually look at of, uh, of kind of what they've built for us is going to be super, super cool. So i um, really excited about this one. So with that, full, uh, John. Full, full, full disclosure, we have not open sourced it yet. Ah, okay. Well, I, I saw mean, it, it is. It's on it's, GitHub. It's, it's on GitHub. It's on a public repo. It doesn't have a license attached to it, but like, if you want to look at it, you can look at it. Uh, it's it's there. Open source. It's open for. Yeah, it's it's open. Like you can. Yeah. <laughs> whether or not you adopt it for your own project, well, that'd be weird. But like, that's <laughs> well, well, this this is a Don't this is a topic we'll cover here. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna mute everybody except for so John. Press the unmute button in a sec. Woo! All right. Uh, let me share screen. Here we go. All right. So everybody see that fine? I hope. Let me just get your faces up here. All right. So pollen. Uh, Bambi's homegrown UI kit. Uh, first off, on the name, why pollen? We're Bambi, but it's B as in buzz. So uh, pollen. Clever name. Uh, one of my biggest contributions to the company thus far. Uh, all right, so uh, first an introduction for myself. Uh, I'm John, principal front end UI engineer at Bambi. Um, formerly was at uh, trying to get Elizabeth Warren elected president. Um, not disappointed by Kamala Harris for vice president. That's cool too. Uh, before that, as a joy mode, uh, doing pretty much the same thing I'm doing here at Bambi, uh, you know, heading up the front end. And then before that, I was at an agency, Blue State Digital, now called Blue State, doing a lot of stuff for like nonprofits and advocacy groups. Um, normal, under normal times, my hobbies include bikes, coffee, beer brewing, cooking, board games, like nerdy board games, like Southerly's Catan is like entry level nerdy for me. I go way nerdier than that. Uh, and then in quarantine, I've been actually doing a lot of like gardening and barbecuing, uh, which has been fun. I, I, this weekend I smoked a brisket for 12 hours and it was fantastic. So, um, that is how I've been spending my quarantine. All right. So, uh, kind of what we're going to talk about here, uh, about Bambi, just as an overview, uh, just to start off with like a, why we built it and like when and why you might consider building your own. Uh, UI kit component library. Uh, I'm going to hand it off to David. He's going to talk a little bit about design uh, at Bambi. He's going to talk about like Figma and the, the tooling that he uses there and a lot of like the modern workflow that's involved with that. Pretty awesome stuff. Um, and then uh, kicking back to me, I'm going to talk about some of the dev tooling that's involved with actually setting this up and how I go about building new components. Uh, I use a lot of storybook. Uh, there's this concept of storybook driven development, which I'll go into. And finally, some tips and tricks, things that I learned. And uh, depending on time, depending on enthusiasm, maybe we'll uh, open up the code browser and just kind of poke around and I can just kind of talk through some things. All right, sound good? Cool. So uh, why would you build pollen or why would you build any component library like from scratch? There's a bunch of off the shelf options, good ones out there like Beautify, Bufy, major ones, uh, you know, Bootstrap or whatever kind of view wrapper goes around Bootstrap. These are all really good UI options. Um, and like, I'm not going to knock them. They're definitely great for certain things. Like they're, for one thing, like if you don't do UI, they're quick to build. Great for prototyping, great for like learning what to do and what not to do. Like as you're prototyping, if you're a startup and you're like building something and you just want to like see, you're doing a lot of like exploring of what your product is and how you want things to actually interact, right? So like you want to just move fast. Um, there's some discovery and that's great. Like that's, that's good. Downside to that, um, there's a lot of bloat when you import things like that. If you don't manage it well, especially uh, when, you know, if you look at Beautify, all the things that are involved with that, 
you, you don't necessarily need everything. They're pretty comprehensive libraries with a lot of options. You don't need all of that. Um, your products will end up looking like Google. I'm specifically talking about Vitify here, which is a material design component library. Like tons of stuff looks like material design these days. Uh, and then a lot of like, you know, at this point I can look at a website and be like, yeah, that's a material design, that's a bootstrap, and that's a foundation. Like the, the component libraries are pretty widespread at this point. So like, fine if you wanna do that. They have great patterns. It's a lot of thinking there. I don't wanna knock it, but if you want to get away from that, you have to do some drawing outside of the lines. And that honestly, like, depending on how much you want it to not look like Google, that might involve a lot of effort of actually like fighting against the framework, trying to overwrite defaults. Um, so that can be an issue. Um, uh, additionally, like because these libraries are designed for people to kind of just be able to adopt and you know, switch some some variables so that it makes it work for their own project. There's a lot of choice and a lot of variables, and that can add its own overhead, which I'll go into in a little bit. Um, finally, uh, you're you're beholden to updates and bugs that come in that aren't necessarily things that you own. Uh, like maybe there's an issue with Vuetify. Uh, and like you could try and fix the bug yourself, but like you're that, at that point you're creating a fork of a dependency and that's just messy. Or you could make a pull request and wait for their review cycle to actually like go in and push for a new release. You're, you're, yeah, you're like, you know, and then maybe that's fine. Maybe you want to play the open source game. Um, uh, but yeah, it's just a thing to consider. Uh, I wanna go back about uh, the problem with choice here. So this screenshot right here is from the Vutify docs. It's for their button component. I have this little red arrow here just to show how long the scroll bar is because there's a lot of props and events and, uh, and like SAS variables that are involved here for you to like go in and overwrite and make it look just the way you want it to. But this is a lot of stuff to ingest as well, right? Like there's a lot of choice here tons of flexibility, but tons of cognitive overhead. So as you're like trying to learn the intricacies of another third party API, be it Beautify, be it, you know, Beaufy or whatever other option, there's on-ramping time. If that's not the one that you know, like if you're a bootstrap person and you have to come on and learn this thing, that's another thing to learn. Um, and you might not even need to learn all of it. You might need the subset, but who knows? So, um, and also like versioning, uh, Vutify 1.0 versus 2.0, there will be breaking changes. There'll be like, if you're on, uh, which Bambi is on Vutify 1.x uh, and you accidentally were reading the 2.x uh, docs uh, and you're like, why is my thing not working? It's because you're reading the wrong version of the docs. Well, that is, uh, you know, <laughs> I imagine that's happened to a few people. I saw Kobe nodding. That's happened to me plenty of times. Um, and that's not just knocking Beautify. That happened with, to me with boot, Bootstrap and jQuery and all kinds of different things. Um, and then finally, like once we know, you know, like once you've actually like get to know your product and or like your design needs, your development needs, once you know what you want, you really only need a subset of these choices. So, you know, maybe it's, even if you're like building a component library from scratch, maybe you're not building it entirely from scratch. Maybe you're taking Beautify and just wrapping it in sensible defaults that make sense. Like they are like, these are the only, like we only have three different types of buttons and they will only be like this. I will only accept these props and that will translate to a Beautify button. But the point is like you are, you're cutting off choice, right? Like now I don't, it's, it's that like Obama talked about how he, only had the same suit in his closet. So he didn't, that's one less choice for him to think about. And then of course the one day that he wears uh, like a, a tan suit, is like look up the like audacity of taupe or like tan gate or whatever, like that became a whole news cycle and it was just an issue. Point is like remove some choice and simplify things. And uh, you know, you can focus on the more important issues of like actually building out your product and being productive. All right. so. Um, the pros and cons of building out your own solution. So pros, we've touched on some of this. Uh, it'll, it's something that'll truly match your brand. It'll look like what you want. Um, once you've established what you're like, your, your default, you'll let your like needs are, uh, you can kind of standardize that. You'll be sorting through, 
you're spending less time sorting through docs and like overriding fighting styles, like having to go in and be like, all right, what is the naming convention of this component in Beautify? And what are the, like, what styles do I need to overwrite now? Um, you're gonna end up having a lot more code reusability because you can like portableize or componentize your your components as opposed to like doing a lot of like V layout, wrapping a V card, wrapping a like V column or something like what, whatever, wherever you're coming from, from third party. Once you know what your patterns are, componentize that. That is your pattern now. Um, so, and then you can take that, use it elsewhere. Uh, you can unify your library API. So by that, I mean like you're speaking like kind of one language. If you look at different, the way that different um, good component libraries are designed, if you look at something like Beautify versus Beaufy, um, Beautify, if you want to center text, I think they have a class called text centered. Um, if you want to center text in Beaufy, I think it's has text centered or something like there's, but the point is they're, they're both consistent as to how they name things. And that's great. Ad ideally you're adopting something with some consistency, but if you start like picking and choosing different libraries, like maybe this, you know, I, I'm not opposed to like building stuff, like using other people's stuff. Like I, when I say like build your own library, I don't mean 100% from scratch. So like V calendar, for example, is a really great view calendar component. Um, you know, like really, you can go really in depth on that and do all kinds of stuff with it. Um, but you don't necessarily need all that. So that's one of those, let me take this third party, let me wrap it in our own component and like cut out choice. And then also let me make, whatever the vocabulary of interacting that and by vocabulary, I mean props and, um, you know, props, classes and events. These are our interfaces within components and view. Let's standardize that. So like is, is like is active or active or disabled versus is disabled or however you want to like name things, pick one and just kind of go with it and then enforce that consistency across different things, even if they're third party things, wrap it in consistency. Um, and then uh, another pro, within your like team, you're creating an internal design language. So uh, David is our designer. I can, we can now start talking about like, uh, like a specific component, like what is the, is this a toast? Is this a meerkat? Is this a uh, snack bar? Like if you know, if the, all of these are names that I've seen everywhere for like little um, notifications that like pop up on the screen and then pop down, you know what I mean? So like you can call it any of those things. Let's just like have it a consistent language that we can both be like that, that snack bar, that toast notification. Um, and that's like one thing, but we can also be like the, you know, our primary color I mean, I know what our primary color is. It's like a purple, right? Like, and I can reference that or like, this is a large spacing versus a small spacing or a loose versus dense, whatever. Like there's a consistent language and like you start to enforce that. Um, some cons, uh, it's, it's more work up front. Like it is, you're, you, it's very easy to just pick up Feudify and start being productive. Like there's been great talks in the past couple of months uh, from people who use, uh, you know, Vutify to be, to, to be able to like crank out stuff. And that's great. Like that's a perfect time to use stuff like that. Um, but, you know, if you want to invest in a bespoke option, uh, you know, depending on the situation it might be worth it, but it is more work up front. Um, Another con, you own your own bugs. Uh, you know, you can Google around and like maybe check Stack Overflow for things, but like it, there's 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 more people with eyes on Vutify uh, that know like if something goes wrong, there's more people that are gonna like yelp about it and like have potential fixes for it. Um, so you know, you might be able to find parallel problems, but sometimes you just kind of got to do the hard work and figure out how to fi fix something on your own. Uh, and then finally, you need to know what you're doing. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that you need to take into consideration that is more than just like, do you know CSS, which you better know CSS, but like beyond that, you need to understand the implications of performance, accessibility, 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 accessibility. It's huge. Um, like if you, there are so many poorly done drop down select components out there. Uh, like when I say that, like unplug, next time you interact with a select component, unplug your mouse, tab to it, press up and down, press the space bar, press enter, and then go to a fancy select component and see if it also does that. Beautify does, um, 
but there's a bunch of other ones that are even like popular ones that don't and that is a really big thing and that's just like keyboard accessibility there's other things to consider like aria roles uh you know like alt text uh semantics just like not everything can be a div you need to make allowances for making things for actually adding headers like h1 h2 semantic tags in there and then yeah aria roles to indicate if you're going to make a pop-up modal like there are aria roles necessary to indicate to screen readers where your attention should be there's like considerations you need to make about tab locking and and uh so that you can only interact within the modal space as opposed to outside of that like there's a, there's a bunch of stuff to think about so um you know that that's big um and i'm not saying like maybe this sounds intimidating to you but on the flip side, if you're making, if you want to try making component library, not necessarily for production, but for your own edification, it's a great way to learn. Like if you want to like dive deep into making things accessible and actually research this stuff, then this is a, this is a great fun side project for you. Um, but in terms of like production level, it's going to be hard. So know that. Um, and then finally, like deep framework knowledge. So whatever you happen to be building this for, it's, it, it's good if you know what you're doing in that realm. So in, in Vue, knowing if you don't know what like functional components are and like how scope slots, name slots work, um, you know, you're, you, that's only like half the battle. You should, you should really know the ins and outs of how to make things like work nicely. Um, and again, if you don't, still I, I, try building a component library. It's fun. Like, I think it's fun. Uh, and you'll learn a lot. Uh, all right, so that is the the why. Uh, now I'm going to hand it off to uh, David Victor here, and he's going to talk design. Uh, you're muted. You want me to take control of the screen, or you can just pop through these? Uh, I can pop. Just just say screen when you want me to like flip. All right, cool. So little little in screen. <laughs> uh, introduction about me. I'm David. I'm the head of design here at Bambi. Uh, formerly, I was creative director at Life is Beautiful Fe Festival in Las Vegas. We started in 2013 and it's still uh, running strong today. I was also head of product at Vet on Demand, which is the first uh, telemedicine application for veterinary care. Unfortunately for your pet owners, it is no longer available. So if someone can find a, uh, uh, an equivalent service, uh, please share. Uh, some things that I enjoy, I like Mezcal, mindfulness and miniature things. I'm actually drinking some mezcal right now. I meditated this morning and I have a collection of miniature chairs that I've purchased on my travels around the world, which I'll share with you guys next time. It's great. <laughs> so that made me back to that. What is a, mini, what is a miniature chair? Is that a mi this big a mini or is that for children or what? Well, it's like literally like this big. Yeah, just like a, an exact model of a chair, uh, like an Eames chair or, uh, I have I have one by Antonio Gaudi as well. I, yeah, just they're just I just like miniature things. I was always fascinated by just like tiny tents and those like tiny sleeping bags they had at Target, and it, just a, a weird quirk of mine. Nice. <laughs> so so the design of Bambi. So we're we're driven by the marriage between a mission driven empathy and customer centric execution. Yeah, those are pretty big words, but like, you know, Bambi is a, is a, is a mission, mission driven company. We want to make life for both employers and employees across the country better. And how do we do that? We do that through empathy and understanding their needs and solving their problems and customer centric ex execution. We have to focus on what, what those needs and problems are and actually do the work that is required to make their life actually better. And we do that really like there's three main philosophies. So we want to be friendly and delightful. We focus on automation and simplicity, and then availability and access are important. So I like, you know, friendly and delightful. What does that mean? Well, it's unavoidably recommendable. You can't stop talking about it. Like the best products that you use, people have told you about, you've heard about, and you want to use yourself. Automation and simplicity, really basically, tasks should be super easy to execute. And if there's a problem, it should alert you, and you shouldn't be able to screw something up. Availability and access, you should be able to access your information everywhere. It should be, it should be private, and private, private and security focused, and it should be there when you need it. Screen. So why did we build Pog? Well, we had a million little problems that really created a really big problem. 
So we were, and still partially are, built on a combination of Beautify and Bulma, and now there's some pollen mixed into it, but we are rapidly moving to a full pollen experience. So when you have two frameworks, that's twice the work. For example, our, our admin application is built in Beautify, and our, and our front-end customer-facing application is built in Bulma. So if we want to build screens or use components or have experiences that exist on both ends, then we actually have to build them twice and nobody wants to do two times the work. They're hard to customize. So you know, if, you, if you're building within the constraints of Beautify, it's pretty straightforward. But as soon as you want to do something unique or apply some kind of branding or build a pattern that doesn't exist, you can you know, import some kind of component or some kind of pattern that exists from a third from a third party another open source project or something that you pay for but to build it yourself these frameworks actually intentionally make it difficult to customize so because they're so quick to use and because so the pieces fit together uh, so snugly it's difficult to break that mold um, for example, in Beautify, using, using your own custom icons, if you're not using material design or font awesome, is a huge pain in the ass. If c customizing any behavior in, a, in an autocomplete dropdown, like if you want to do anything that's not available through the props in Beautify, like John said, you basically have to fork the thing and add, add your code on top of it. And you also have to follow the same patterns that those authors made, which you may or may not understand. Like some of these authors use, I would say, undesirable, and that's a that's a light word, uh, code patterns that um, a lot they often have. I, it feels like something to prove, and so the level level of complexity and uh, opinionality, if that's a word, is uh, is strong. We we experienced some problems with beautify modals with the form input, using having to wrap everything within the beautify app component. Their breakpoints are very strange. So you would think that a breakpoint would be very straightforward, but they actually use a, a, hard, a hard coded value. Uh, that's a, it's a really long, it's not, a, it's not an integer, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a number. Uh, it's, I think it's like nine or 10 digits to calculate the, the external margins on any breakpoints, which makes it really difficult uh, to build I don't want to say pixel perfect because we actually shouldn't strive for that, but accurate representations of, of, of breakpoints within your design system. Uh, and then global style. So like, the, like when you have Beautify and Bulma together and then a, additional global styles, those tend to overlap. And just depending on your, your, uh, your import order, you can just have problems that you really just don't want to deal with. Um, so that's you know, some of the problems with two frameworks. Um, Beautify, for example, when we upgrade, when we are, we haven't actually done it, and I don't think we will, but upgrading from 1.4 to 2.1 or 2.0 is a huge headache. They actually rewrote their grid system. So we would have to go into every single page, every single component, and use their new grid system if we wanted to be able to use Beautify 2.1. So that basically, if we don't want to spend that much time as, a, as an organization, then we're stuck on 1.4. And like John said, there's confusing aspects about the documentation. You're, you don't have access to the new features. The earl, earlier versions are sunsetted and they stop supporting them. So bugs go unresolved. And all, all the focus on the, on the community is on, your, is on your newer versions. So that just, not only is it more difficult to work with, it, it, it makes you feel left behind. Um, the branding's not unique. Uh, yeah, that's, that's an obvious one. You know, if you want your product to work look like Google, then for sure use Beautify or any type, type of material design library. If you want your, your product to look like everybody else, then uh, use Bootstrap. But if you want something unique that you can not only start with a unique style, but continually improve it, then I would highly recommend building your own UI framework. And then, you wrap, you're going to end up, if you're doing things right and scalable, you're going to end up wrapping those components anyway. So I've got a beautify button. I'm going to wrap it in Bambi button and then import it. That way I'm, I'm managing my, my, my webpack builds, I, managing the props that are available. Like John said, there's too many. You want to limit them. You're still going to be essentially creating your own UI library with maybe like 50% of the work. So 
you have if you have have the motivation and uh, the time to to put into it, building your own UI library is only just a little bit more work. Uh, slide. All right, so Figma. We use Figma as our design tool. Um, it's hands down the best user interface tool I've ever used. Um, I got my start using Illustrator and Firework, Fireworks way back in the day. Um, there was a whole period of time where people were using Photoshop and striving for pixel per perfect development. Um, then Sketch came along and Sketch was, was the, the tool to use for, for a long time. Um, they did a really good job paring down the interface and, and giving focus on what you actually need to build user interfaces, which is essentially just building rectangles. And they made that really easy. Uh, but I think, I don't know what happened over at Sketch, but they, they, they slowed down their, their new feature creation. They, they bogged themselves down with uh, some re-architecting patterns that basically would make your, your design and your design system uh, stale uh, pretty quickly over, over, over the period of six to 12 months. And then you have to kind of rebuild everything using the new patterns that they created. And it just, it just didn't age very well. Um, so why is Figma great? Well, it's browser-based in WebGL and it's super fast. Um, I, I don't know how many of you have, have used Sketch or, or built really large design systems or projects within it, but it, it crawls to a halt very quickly. Um, with Figma, it's really seamless library availability and updating. So you can, you can create libraries within a project, you can publish those libraries, you can make updates to those libraries, uh, share components, update components within five seconds. So we originally at Bambi were using Sketch with Abstract. Abstract is a, is a, it's its own company, its own software that basically is a Git repository to Sketch since in the, un, underneath the hood, Sketch is essentially just a really large JSON object, it says text. So they can have a, a, a Git style repo. But I was telling John earlier, with, with Sketch and Abstract, it's, it's branch based. So uh, you're working your library, which is its own, which is its, its own uh, essentially repo. And you've got to branch the thing you're doing currently. Oh, I'm going to change this button or I'm going to add a new button size or whatever. You have to publish that branch, merge that branch into master, publish that master branch to your repo, push it, and then switch over to your, the project you're working in with your application. You have to pull down the master of the library. You have to then branch it off. And then, then you have your, your updates available to you. And that process takes about three to five minutes uh, with all the uploading and downloading. It's, it's, it's very painful. Um, so if you're doing that 50 times a day, which is, which you are, when you're working in multiple libraries in a, in a complex user, user interface system, you are, I mean, that's like two hours of work or two hours of time. That's just wasted waiting. Uh, not ideal with, with Figma. That's uh, essentially instantaneous. Um, Figma done a really good job keeping their features stable and having non breaking updates. So I like not one time has, Figma, and they've been around since 2012. I started using them at Bambi uh, in 28, the beginning, of, the beginning of last year, beginning of 2019. Um, but they have not broken anything once. They can, they've added new features and added new capabilities to existing features, but they never make things that you've done in the past stale, which is amazing. And because it's browser-based, every time you open it in your browser, they, they do have uh, Windows and, and, and um, Mac OS desktop tools, but they're essentially just wrapped in the browser wrapped. Uh, everything is always updated. It's, it's always fresh, it's always current. Um, they've just done a really bang up job of, uh, of ensuring uh, scalability in their platform. Um, Figma's got great built-in prototyping. Uh, you can switch to prototyping mode, take any, any components link it to another screen they have different interactions with click or it's mouse over or it's drag or whatever. 
It just makes it really easy to build interactive prototypes. And then inspection is already built in. So our engineering team, they have a login to Figma, they just open up the project, they click around just like a designer would, except for they are exposed to the actual code and the components that they can copy and paste any code or see which components are being used very easily without having to have an in-between tool like Zeppelin or Envision that requires keeping that one current, uh, updating it, sharing those links. It's just one tool to rule them all. Um, Figma's got really smart defaults. Um, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit about those when I dive into Figma later, but just the things, it just, things just work. And there's a lot of things under the hood that are not even mentioned in their documentation that go totally unnoticed by the user that just makes it a breeze and a pleasure to use. Um, they've got super powerful plugins. And I know if anyone was thinking about making the, the transition between Sketch and Figma for a long time, Sketch was the only platform that really had a lot of plugins. Um, Figma released the plugin API and within six months, it, it might have more plugins than Sketch at this point. And because it's, because it's browser-based and because they did a really good job hammering out their API early, there's no, think plugins don't break, they don't screw up your, your designs like they do in, in Sketch sometimes. Every, everything automatically updates in the background um, and then everything is downloaded directly from the, from the Figma interface as, a plug, as opposed to in Sketch, you know, they were like, individual repositories for plugins and, and different versions and they, they would go stale and not maintain and break. It was, it was a mess. And then there's a, also a huge community in Figma. I know, again, Sketch has been the leader in user interface community for a long time. You, know, you can download from Apple the, the iOS interface or there's a, there's a Safari uh, window or there's like all these different things. You can go to all these different like resource sites and just download things to make your life as a designer easier. Figma has almost from nowhere grown from zero to there's, there's tens of thousands of community resources. I'll show you a few of them when I dive into the tool here in a bit. Uh, next slide. All right, well, let's dive into uh, Figma. I'll poke around a little bit and show you pollen and show you some of the benefits of using Figma. I'm going to steal the screen here. All right, cool. So let's pop into Figma first. So Figma, this is the browser based, this is the well, this desktop based application, which is a wrapper of their browser. Um, they have a little tab here, community, and they've got, you know, different, different categories. These are all just different files that people in the Figma community have made. There are design systems, there are tutorials, there are you know, brow browsers here, all the different iOS browsers for uh, Safari mobile and for uh, Chrome mobile. You can do mood boards, there's how to run a design sprint. I mean, it's, you can actually play games. People build, build games on Figma. So like one of the interesting things about it, they have a thing called multiplayer where the same file that's opened across different users everyone's mouse is visible and all the changes are being made at the same time. It's, 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 it's really fun to, to interact with the, with the, with a document with a number of different people. Um, so this just goes on, this just goes on forever. I mean, there are about literally thousands of different big plugins. So if you are scared to make the switch, not knowing if the community is out there, it certainly is. Um, also plugins, right? So we'll switch here. Just set it fast, right? Um, so plugins, you know, all the plugins that you would assume were available that are available in Sketch are also available for Figma now. Unsplash images, content reel, which I'll give you guys a demo of here in a bit. Or omit some, put in charts, add a map, avatars, all these different things that are that are not only active, ma actively maintained, but wide in breadth. So, I mean, this, this goes on forever. If, you, if, you, if there's something you don't think you can do in Figma, there almost assuredly is a plugin that you can do it with. Um, it's a pretty, pretty amazing ecosystem. 
All right, let's poke around in pollen. So before I actually dive into pollen, let's talk about libraries. So like pollen is its own library. Here it's labeled UI Kit Web. So this is all of the components that are for our web application that includes anything on the desktop and mobile, but it's built in the browser. There's a separate library called brand, and that's where I keep really high level design tokens, particularly colors. So here's all of our brand colors, and these are shared in the library. You can see I listed them here over on the right. Can we actually zoom in on this one a little bit? This is beautiful, uh, yeah. by the way. Very yeah, cool. Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. So, yeah, we've got, our, got our, our primary and secondary colors, different tints and shades that are used throughout the UI. All that, of our that's probably a little too much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All, all, of our, all of our different grayscales. I have an extended color scheme to add a little bit more personality when, when necessary in the UI. So our semantic colors, error warning, success, and info, you guys are all aware of those throughout the different frameworks. And different effects. These are transparencies across black, transparency, transparencies across white. Then I've included some different third-party brand colors for like Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. We can see them all listed right here, and these are shared as a public library. I can't do it right now because it's already shared, but you can just you publish this, and now it's available to all of the other files across your project. So, so David, if, if yeah. you may, just as people who are not designers like me, like just you know, talk to me a little bit more about kind of how these are each being used as you think through the plugin. You have to address it right now, but as you look at the plugin, say like, oh, note now that, you know, like, hey, we're using the extended color scheme or yada, yada, like just so we get a sense of kind of seeing it through the, through the, through Pollen yeah, itself. Yeah, to totally. So there, yeah, I've, I've, uh, I had some experience as a front end engineer for a few years, so I know how web applications are built and I've had experience building them both the right way and the wrong way. Um, so that kind of really informed the way I set Figma up. I, I understand that a, an engineer is going to need these colors or wh whatever colors I'm going to use. So those are, those are posted as tokens. And I'll show you when I actually dive into Pollen that they're immediately available and tagged so that these same colors that exist in what John's building, have, they have the same naming structure. They, if, if I update, I can just tell John, update the color, and it updates everywhere. Um, few more things that are in, in the brand, any kind of logos that we have, um, images. This is Ashley. She's our, our, our stock uh, HR manager. Um, and just some, some different graphics um, that are used. All right, so diving into Pollen itself. I've, if everyone's familiar with Atomic Design, Brad's Frost Atomic Design, I think it's a really good way to think about uh, componentization. And it's basically atoms, molecules, and organisms. and those feed in one into the next, um, just like they do in nature. Atoms are your smallest pieces, uh, your buttons, your inputs, your selects, things that are kind of like used once, topography styles. Uh, molecules are a bunch of those things put together. So like alerts, uh, like a, a user pill, a stepper that use multiple atoms together to create a, a, a larger component. And then organisms, those are actually pieces of the application itself, like headers, navigations, modals, et cetera. Um, I added, uh, in the, way, the way I frame this, I've added laws as well. It's not included in Brad's, Brad Frost's uh, philosophy, but those are your, your additional colors, breakpoints, spacing, et cetera. So we can dive into those. These are, these are colors that aren't used in the wider brand. So I also use those brand colors to build out like print collateral and web ads and all that stuff. But it's all connected to the same brand colors that exist within that library. So if I make a change there, it propagates across all of my files, which are now, you know, probably close to two dozen of them. But these are, these are colors that are only for the web UI kit itself and only really used in one place. Um, building out breakpoints, you know, breakpoints are obviously super important to any web application. So defining them here and, ha and having, having the ability to not only like see what changes at what breakpoint, for example, you know, what's the, what's the menu and the header behavior at each breakpoint? A regular menu and header here, it shrinks down, no change. Enlarge, we collapse, we collapse the menu. 
in a tablet, the menu goes away and we get the header, uh, the tablet version of the header, and that goes all the way down to a mo uh, mobile device. And that makes it really easy for someone like John to build out these rules in code, and then they directly match what's actually happening in the design system. Grids are really important as well. So you can toggle on your grids with- uh, if, I, if I back up a little bit and ask the question, yeah. just how much- oh, yeah is there between, if you'd go back a step, um, between, you know, taking these, these, these different versions and actually putting it into code? Like, what is the, I mean, that's a, almost like an answer for both David and John, like how much, how much is pre-built in Figma that you could actually grab versus is it just like, this is just completely conceptual and then you have to code it up completely separately? Uh, a ton. Uh, I'm going to let, yeah, I'm going to let David, like a ton of like, well, so we have these examples here in breakpoints. A lot of this stuff gets translated directly into Tailwind, which I'll talk about, uh, in the next section of like how I translate this into basically a big old JavaScript object that can be moved around and reused. Um, but also like the, the design developer handoff, Figma does a really good job about that. And like, I'll, we'll, I'll see how, what like what David's going to talk about, but I'll, I'll be sure to talk about that as well um, when I get into it. Okay. I, I, I think you know there, there's you know just like just like all design and engineering decisions, there's a lot of choice involved, right? So at, at Bambi, you know we 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 like to move fast, and we don't necessarily have uh, as much time as we all as creators would like to perfect things across five or six breakpoints, right? So I won't design a component at each one, one of these breakpoints. What I'll, what I'll do is I'll design a component that I know, you know, I know it's going to scale through these first three or four, and then I'll design a mobile version that has as much similarity to the, the desktop version as, as possible, and also using my knowledge as a front-end engineer. But, okay, this is actually going to be pretty easy to, well, we'll just, well, the, the columns will collapse under each other or, or, or whatever. So you just have to make intelligent decisions about what's best for you and your business and, and, and uh, where you are currently in, uh, in building out your product. Um, so yeah, I was saying grids, you just basic grids. So you have fluid, fluid grids, 12, I have 12 columns. Uh, Here's a, here's a, is a maximum with 960 and a maximum with 768 with two different gutters, one 16 pixels and one 24 pixels. And so, you know, talking about pixels, um, I just, as most design softwares are, they're built in pixels, but we use an eight point grid, which translates directly to the REM values that John uses. So that when he sees a pixel value, he knows, okay, you know, divide by eight, and then that's my, that's my REM value. I'm sure he has uh, a, uh, a post CSS plugin that, <laughs> that, does that, that does that automatically. But that, so what's actually being rendered in the browser is in REMs, but what is being created here in the design system is in pixels. Um, yeah, here's an example of that spacing elements. So while I don't actually use these elements themselves that much, these are actually translated into Tailwind. So like a MR-1 is, is one pixel, and that's a component that's in here. So if I actually need to put that spacing component in some kind of other component that I've built in the system, it's, it's in, you can immediately know what it is. But since I built everything on an eight-point grid, we can do some quick back of the napkin or for really good in our heads math. And yeah, no. just to like go over this. So the, the REMs are REM, one REM is 16 pixels. So, uh, and that's MR, like M4. You can see that like the four here. And each quarter of that is um, four pixels. So that is, yeah, where, where our eight, eight, eight pixel grid kind of comes in. So like all of our spacing is like, if I want to do like margin bottom 16, that's MB-4. Uh, but I'll, that's like Tailwind stuff, and I'll get into that. If you're familiar with Vutify, though, that's also, I think they, they do something pretty similar. But yeah, it's all, that, yeah, is, good, that good. is the math. Yeah, it's a, they're making sure the developer handoff is super smooth. So, you know, I, 
I don't know how many, you probably worked with a bunch of designers in your day and, you know, depending on their experience, you know, they can, they can be quite bespoke. Um, and that's not, not the best uh, process for in, ensuring really smooth developer handoff. So John and I have worked closely together and I was familiar with Tailwind when we got started. So we, we, we settled on, uh, on patterns pretty quickly. So another thing, I've, I've defined different animation speeds here and different curves. Uh, you know, that really doesn't apply to Figma itself, but I'm, I've put this stuff in pollen. And there's going to be a lot more of that stuff put in pollen as we grow. So it's not necessarily has to do with Figma itself, but is defined in our design system. Um, here's all, all of our topography. So you've got these different sizes like legal, caption, small, text, medium, and large, and then different weights of each. And each one of these is defined here. There's a drop down. I can, I, can, I can change it pretty easily. But all of these are also built in code. So anytime John, John sees, you know, body, medium, medium, he knows that it's this size, can add, add a class, and it's going to exactly match what's in Figma. We have different styles. So like, you know, these are just different shadows that we use, different blurs for the background, using background blur, and then different border styles. Whether it's left, right, top, bottom, X, Y, all, et cetera. Some different elements that we've built just out. Just going back to that last one a little bit, you look, the yeah. blur, for example, like what's the, I mean, I just don't think it, I, I'm not a designer. So like, why, why would you need three different blurs? Uh, well, great, great question. So for two, so there, there might be one board that you use for the, the background of an overlay of a modal. So when you put a modal over your entire screen, it kind of blurs that out and then you have a color that, that distracts from the focus behind, or you might have some kind of loading state where you don't want to blur it out too much. You don't want a 12 pixel blur because then it's, you can't really see anything that's behind it but you want, might want a four pixel blur so you can get a little bit of the rendition of, of what you're expecting. So these different blur states just assist in, in the UI and, and help, helping, helping guide the user to, uh, to, to the right place with their eye and their mouse. That's great, thank you. Yeah. So elements, you know, these are just some quick little elements that we made, you know, dividers, horizontal dashed with a, with a label and vertical. Here's some progress loaders. Here's the, the I guess, maybe call it, the, not the stub, that's the wrong word, but obviously there's no animation in, in, in Figma here, but I can design these things and, and put these components in. And then the thing, the actual loader that we've built, which we've called the annual throbber, John can probably talk about that as well. Uh, we can, you can know, hey, this is the loader that we want to use in this setting. Um, here's a, here's a credit card. Um, so I've defined like these primitive credit cards, these ones solid colors and one light colors. And then here's all the different settings that are available. But one really cool thing about Figma, this is the actual component itself. I don't know if you can see my sidebar here, but it's just called color here. I can open up color and there's a bunch of different layers here and most of them are turned off. I can just change the visibility on different layers and it changes the, the visibility I've made a, it it changes the the expression of that component so that it works really well for for especially when you get to complex components and having different states you don't necessarily have to make a different state for a component you can just have these toggleable options just like you would in the web, like, oh, is this, a, is this a paid success state or is this a paid error state or whatever? And that's all nested within the same co component. So I have less components to think about in my mind and then less components for, for John to, to look at when he's actually assembling the app. It's like, oh, that's just a credit card component color. And yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. The, the, like, the, like the view equivalent here is we're talking about props, right? Like these are different like states that something can be in. These are different props that you would pass in. So like there is, we're actually like, it's not just a visual design of the component at this point. We're starting to think through different states and the implications of that in terms of props and local state for the thing. So like, there's like, there's a lot of kind of richness 
in the even in the code design that can be found purely just in like the in a well designed um, Figma design system. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And here's a, another little thing, just a message like, hey, when I, my HR manager says something to you, here's a couple of different versions, um, side and vertical, small and low, that can be used. Um, here's our button library. Everyone loves buttons, right? So uh, the way things are built in Figma, which is uh, obviously a little bit different than code, is you use, it's, this is purely a nomenclature thing and a process thing, but I use, a concept called primitives, right? So I've made primitives of my buttons, and these are the these have the sizes, the spacing of those buttons, and you can see they're all purple just because purple is our brand color. But they're just these like flat rectangles. Now, when I actually build the buttons that we want to use in the application, I have my button component, and then nested inside of it is the primitive. Now the, the styles that are applied to this button are applied at the, at the actual component level, but those primitives exist here independently in, in, in one instance. That way, if I wanna change, I wanna change the size of this text or I wanna change the spacing, I just do it in one place and it's gonna apply itself across all of the different color variants that I've created. Now, you know, again, it, you have to choose to do this. So Figma makes it really easy. I could just create one button and then use it all over the app and just override the color or override the text style wherever I want to. But that doesn't translate to what John is building. So there's a there's a one to one relationship in what the components that are available for a designer to use and what's available in the UI kit for the developer to use. And that makes it really simple and straightforward to know exactly what your, what code you're supposed to use. And you don't have to like, you know, engineers like, uh, I didn't see this component in the, in the UI kit. And then they just like build right custom override styles and it dirty, it dirties up your code and, 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 and makes it unsustainable. Like, yeah. Could you click on like one of these buttons and then on the right hand side, click on the, I think code t uh, tab is the one that'll show it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So see here the commented out standard medium auto layout shadow two. So shadow two corresponds to the drop shadow that you had seen in an earlier slide of like his drop shadow styles. There's like five different drop shadow styles. So this is shadow two. So I know to apply the shadow two. I've already tokenized shadow two, or I've already tokenized like um like some 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 other like whatever the font like body text medium or something for the typography like that's all been tokenized already i'm not even paying attention to the like the actual code underneath i'm can just like oh sorry continue i just want to point to shadow two when you're seeing oh you're you're saying that what's commented out got it okay yeah yeah, yeah so that's like it's just a right. code comment it's saying like this yep. the stuff beneath me filter drop shadow data, that's shadow yeah. two and that uh -huh. to me that means like i'll just apply the shadow two rule to this component as opposed to like copying and pasting the actual thing i've already abstracted out shadow two to its tailwind equivalent yeah right and that exists so you know, here's here's yeah. inputs as well so like body text regular body, like that here, here's body text regular you know uh, kind of a kind of fumbled that one i actually don't have the 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 topography components connected to the buttons but i do have them in inputs so you can see that body text regular he just knows what that is and he can just apply the right classes. Uh, just because we're jumping uh, around, can you show us the, th the, the shadow one and three around next to shadow? So we can just see what the different options are. Oh yeah, totally. So I'll, I'll just do that here. I'll make a, I'll make a frame here. It's going go into design. I have here in my effects, this four button menu here, click. I, this is all the different styles that I have available in my, in my kit that I've published. I can say, hey, here's, here's shadow one, or I want shadow six. And so all of those are already in code. Cool. Yeah, all those are already in code and just, and just classes that can be applied to any component. Very cool. Yeah, so here, here, here are different inputs, right? Here's our, here's our primitives here for, for text and for password. Um, 
it's kind of interesting here, you know, like we, we can dive in. I've got different password partials, which are our, uh, uh, the, 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 the pass, uh, password complexity meter. And then header, these different labels, head, label headers and later label footers, which I can, I'll show you when I dive into the organism, which is the input group. But all of these are applied across all of these different styles. So our standard text, our standard password, our, our standard text area, and then our raised version here, and then going into our ghost versions, light and dark. So all of these are available uh, at the at the top level of Figma, but they also apply to the the styles and the and the and the props that are available to the inputs uh, that John has created. Um, Without going on a huge detour, like how much of this did you guys just sit down and create like a massive checklist like ahead of time of like it needs to just do blah. Uh, well, you know, I, we, 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 we can yeah yeah we can I mean we can we can touch on it at the end, but okay. You know, luckily for, for John and I, uh, we've both done this before. So our checklist was relatively light. I was like, I'm gonna make buttons and I'm gonna make inputs. And he was like, cool, I'll build buttons <laughs> and, and, and inputs. So you know, we, had a, we had a checklist of all of the things that, that you, you know you need in an application. So we did lay out a, you know, a, a, a multi-sprint path to to pollen and then can, we worked we worked in parallel to get it done. Um, you, as we as we continue to add to pollen, things are going to become more specific. And then you know we I can't just be like hey I'm going to add a card like we actually hey this is this is the thing I'm going to add. I've added it. It's ready now. It's passed to him in you know whatever product project management software we use for for John it's Jira and for me it's as of yesterday Asana. So yeah, it's, it, it just really takes communication. And yeah, of course there is a process to it, but um, at the beginning it was pretty fluid. Yeah, I'd say for the most part, it was a staggered kind of like, all right, this week I'm working on buttons, uh, like as a developer, cause you designed them last week and uh, you're gonna work on inputs and then next week I'll build out the inputs. And you know, this is like, what, whatever, like the staggering like that. Um, but it's also like, there's, there's back and forth of like, hey, how does this work if, you know, it's an error, a disabled error state or something like that. Like, you know, like, but it is, it's just the two of us, but like David's done front end and I've done design, like I, 10 years ago, I was a designer. So like, we both kind of speak each other's language, but we're, we're distanced from that and like in our own realms, but like understand each other. So like really good collaboration, I think. Yeah, totally. I mean, like, you know, you know, this all like looks super great and tight, but like I've, I've made mistakes and I've, I've forgotten things and John will be like, Hey, like, uh, how is this supposed to work? And I'm like, ah, shit. Uh, okay. It's supposed, it's supposed to work like that. And then I'll, I'll tell him he'll build it in code and then I'll update the Figma design to, to reflect that. But I tried, you know, try to do my best to show different states of things. You know, here's like different settings and icons on different sides and what are the hover active focus and disabled. So you're tr trying to, to, to show this stuff in Figma, like whether like this stuff right here is are not, these are not components in Figma. Like I don't really care in Figma about having a hover or an active state because the, the way where prototyping is right now, like you, you can't, you can't create an action for a single component. It's really just like page to page. That's a limitation of design tools. I'm, I assume in the future it'll change. But then all I have to do is like make these actual components and then update those prototypes later. I, I know that Figma's not going to screw that up. Yeah, that's the beauty of it. Because like if, you know, if there is a change in the, the active state for a secondary button, I, like we don't need to sweat it. We just update it in pollen and, and right. bump the, the version and everybody, you know, everybody gets it. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's like, you know, a really big thing that... I, it, it might be glossed over too, you know, like a lot of people assume that like designers always know what they're doing and that's totally not true. Um, like I will build stuff out and, and choose colors and, and choose spacing and just kind of like make something, but then maybe I go back to it a week later or, you know, maybe the, we want to, 
some kind of like spark of inspiration and we want to change something in some di some direction i can make those changes globally in figma and then it's really easy for john to make those updates in pollen itself and then translate it to the app so up updating these small things and, and constantly tweaking your design and constantly tweaking your ui which you know as a as a designer you want to do as an engineer of course you want to do and then as a company you have a responsibility to do you know like you uh, we want to have a design system that lasts a very long time and can always be manipulated and, and changed and sh shifted based upon you know, all of the different uh, uh, things that like impact a company or impact a team. So having a really, really tight integration between Figma and, 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 and code makes that process really, really easy. Um, so I'll just go through, a few, you know, Keep going through these things. Here's select select boxes with drop downs. Here's an upload component. Here's different selections. So like here's my here's my primitives that kind of define the size and, and the shape and the different pieces inside of it. And then check boxes standard. Here's them checked. However, like you see all these different components that are that are here, but actually. It's just these two top rows that are selectable in my component list. So everything, every other one of these is just an instance of this one. If I go into my small left here, checkbox, I can just turn on checked and checked is there. So I only, I only have to use this one component group, which is a checkbox and a label anywhere, and it's capable of creating all of these different versions just based on what's available inside the component with toggleable layers. So it makes my life easier and it makes John's life easier as well. Yeah, and again, so, like this is a like that's a prop. Like you I see that, I'm like, oh, okay, that needs to be a prop. Like I know how to design the component in terms of code because here's like here's the thing that we're physically turning on and off that could be, you know, like it's 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 a it's like it's so illuminating when you actually like start to get into this there's like a really rich like level of thinking that goes into this that you can like draw from yeah so like you know i've got these settings for these labels here like here's where the labels are defined is there as their primitives and then i can just click into this label itself and i can turn on a hint you saw the, the box actually expand. That's auto layout, which I'll talk about here in a bit. But like, I can add a hint. Is there a button? Oh, there's not. Like, so these are all props that can be passed that are also displayed here. But I only have to go in here and copy and paste into another project or, or, or use through the inspector and, and, and place just a couple of different options. Um, chips, pretty standard thing different versions of chips. Here's tags. So I talked about my extended color scheme before with tags, I've created different versions with all these different colors and whether it's a filled or it's a ghost version. Badges, really. I'm gonna back up, like I showed you and said it yet. It's, it's all really beautiful guys, so well done. I mean, just look at this and it really kind of gives you a sense of like all the different variations you have. You look at the fill, you know, the fill and the outline, just the badges alone, like, it finally gives you a sense. You step back from all the stuff you're talking about, just like so many beautiful options. So well done. Yeah, appreciate it. So, you know, badges, really complex component. It's a circle with a number in it, but like this here, here's the primitive and then here's the different versions. So I, I try to do my best to, to expand out the actual labeled component options that are available in the picker. And, you know, John talked about limiting options. I, I, that's an important process step. It's like, okay, I've, obviously I could, I, could take, I could take this component here and I could change its color to, to warning, but I haven't defined that color as an option that's available in the interface kit. That, that means like a developer shouldn't be able to choose it. Even though it's possible in Figma, we've defined these options and those are translated to code. Here's different avatar states. So avatar is actually 
su surprisingly one of one of our most complex components uh, in Figma. So I've got my 104 pixel avatar. I can open it up. Here's my primitive, which is defined right here. But inside the primitive, I've made all these different folders, essentially, uh, which are called frames of different versions. So whether we want to add a border or not, and here's a square border as well. That square border can be triggered by unchecking the mask. I've got, I can unselect these the borders and roles, and then I have like 20 different or more portrait uh, of the llama, like all these all these different portraits that are available that are just great to use in the UI. But this is a single component that I can call in Figma that I have all these different options. So things that make my life as a designer easy also make John's life as, as a developer easy. And then I've kind of defined those settings here. So what I'm imagining is that you then have like 50 different prop options you could be trickling down. Is that what the code ends up, ends up looking like? It, it, it does, it does. So like, that's why communication is super important. So like, you know, obviously John isn't gonna create a prop for each one of those different images. But those are those make my life easier, and so I must tell John, hey, I obviously don't import all of these images and put them as part of the avatar prop. The avatar is just going to accept the image that's sent to it. But I can I can use the same feature set to to, to enrich my designs. So that yeah. one, for example, I'm guessing is going to have size, square, circle, rounded. Yes. What yes. are the other ones roughly? Uh, there's like no image, so what's your, what's, your, what's your default image? And then we have a thing called initials, right? So if you have no image, but you have a name, sure. then you get your first and last. Yeah, but like, I, keep in mind, if any of these, you know, I don't know how we're doing on time, but like, if any of these are like, really, you want to know, I'm happy to like dive into the code side of this as well. Uh, once we get back to like talking about the code, code of stuff, yeah. but you know, like, start, start some, and I'll, I'll, I'm happy to like, talk about uh, any specific ones? We yeah. do. By the way, we have about we have a little over half an hour left, and I, I would like to block off some of that time for right. looking through the code. Like walk us through one of these. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, if we only have half an hour left, I mean, I will, I will, I think I, there was one demo that I think is super important that I'll that I'll jump to and do really quickly, and then we can have John dive in. So I want I want to I want to show you how fast it is to build a form with all of this stuff. So I, I create a frame. You know, people are familiar with Illustrator or Sketch. There's a concept called artboards. Artboards doesn't exist in Figma. It's this infinitely nested frames, which kind of like takes out that arbitrary top level. Anyway, all right. So I've got, I've got a frame. I'm going to go back into my UI kit. I'm going to go to my input groups. I'm going to select just a regular input and label. I'm going to put, I'm going to paste three of these in here. I'm going to go into my buttons. I am going to, I want, I want like a large, this is a block button. I'm going to go in here. I'm going to paste that into here. I'm going to turn on auto layout right here. I'm going to make my horizontal padding 48. I'm going to make my vertical padding 48. I'm going to make the space between each thing six, 16. I'm going to change the, the width of this to 360 pixels. And then I'm going to click each one of these and choose expand. I'm going to choose six pixels. I'm going to give it a little shadow. Boom, you got a form. So it's like once, once you set all this stuff up and you leverage the power of auto layout, which I didn't get a chance to really dive into, maybe that's a talk for next time. Um, it's really easy to make dope shit fast. I mean, as someone who was a designer for like six years, manually pushing pixels, pixel by pixel, that is fucking nuts. Like that's awesome. <laughs> that's so I'm cool. Sh I'm sure David would be just as easy for me when I try to do it at home 20 minutes <laughs> from now. But no, it's cool. really nice that you can just, that you own your tools that way. That's great. All right. Awesome. John, you want to take over? Yeah. All right. So that's uh, a little bit of background on what the uh, the dev side is. Let me share my screen again. I'll get, 
I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, or sorry, the design side. I'll talk a little bit about the dev side. All right, so the dev side. Um, yeah, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, kind of, uh, yeah, uh, the, just the tooling, and then depending on time, we'll, we'll, we'll do some like code spelunking. Uh, Kobe used that phrase, I like it. Uh, if you don't know what spelunking is, that's where you like repel into a cave. Uh, so that we will we will go into a cave. All right, so some tooling. Um, yeah, just a brief overview. I'm using Vue, obviously, because it's a Vue meetup. We use Vue at Bambi, and I'm building Vue components. So I'm using Vue CLI. At Bambi, we actually use Nuxt for all of our web applications, but this is a portable, like, front, purely front-end thing using Vue CLI. It has a library build mode in Webpack that will specifically bundle up your code for library consumption. Um, I'm using Tailwind CSS as our uh, CSS library, uh, which does a lot of tokenization of our styles. I'll go into that a little bit. Uh, I'm using Storybook to actually build these components in isolation uh, and like visually test them um, uh, before actually releasing them to the wild. And then I'm using Netlify to host our Storybook uh, and uh, using GitHub Actions to automatically deploy this um, package to uh, NPM. All right, so how does this all just work? Real quick, just story driven, story driven development. Is oh, that yeah, an actual term that. or is that something? No, I'm just, is that an actual oh. term or is that like a John term? <laughs> uh, it's an actual term that I think okay. is kind of funny, but I keep saying it. So I, I guess there's something to it. It's one of those like kind of semi ironic things that I say, like full full stack front end development, which is, <laughs> uh, I like to say that as well. I, I consider myself a full stack front end developer and I say that with the full, understand the full irony of that but anyways yes storybook driven development is the thing i'll talk about that a little bit but you can you can google it somebody else coined the phrase i did not make it up uh all right so building the thing uh we use vcli uh there's a you there's a you can do a lib target in vcli it looks like this right here um and essentially what that does is you point it to some main.js or some file and it'll spit out you know the compatible node and uh, ECMA and uh, module compatible versions of this that you need, as well as the CSS file that's all bundled up. When you want to use it, you're going to npm install Bambi Pollen, and then you're going to import whatever specific component you want in uh, Pollen. Um, this is working. I don't love it. I, I want to actually try roll up, but like. I'm, I'm working with the default now, which is Vue CLI is using Webpack to bundle this all up. I've used Rollup in the past for React component libraries, and that actually like made better bundles. Um, but that is a another a, an, an issue for another time. Right now, I'm focused on actually building Pollen. Rollup is instead of Webpack. Is that I've never heard of Rollup. Uh, yeah, Rollup rolls up stuff to be used as uh, libraries on the internet, yeah. whereas Webpack okay. more optimizes building out uh, your application into asynchronous chunks that can be used on the web. Like the, they both do similar things, but I think Rollup is actually probably a better solution for this. Um, I think Vue CLI's library target build is actually targeted towards building like a component to be used as opposed to a library of components to be used. Mm. Um, I'm not convinced that the tree shaking uh, when you're actually using pollen right now is as good as it could be. So that, but that's a like, right now I'm building pollen. Next step, I will optimize pollen, but like that is a thing to think about in the future. Shake the tree harder later. Yeah, shake the, which uh, if you don't know what tree shaking is, that's where I'm like, I, I only want the base button from pollen. I don't want all of pollen. So when I import base button, I only want to import base button. I want to shake the tree and make all the unnecessary leaves fall out. All right. So, um, so Tailwind CSS, uh, this is a, uh, just as a brief intro, if you don't know what it is, it's the utility CSS framework. I love it. It's been my choice of, ways to go about building CSS these days. Uh, I gave a talk with the Vue.js group for several months ago about You can see why John's I, talk on our YouTube channel. You can check the YouTube channel. So yeah, check it out. Uh, YouTube Vue.js LA and then look up John's Tailwind to CSS talk. Yeah, I can go like I you the much deeper detail into that, but essentially like every 
individual CSS rule has a, a class equivalent. And so you can atomically build out your classes, like you can see in this example here, you know, H16, W16, like the, all these things accomplish one specific thing uh, and you compose together your CSS styles like that and you skip the, the step of having to create the, uh, a like a class name that is kind of semantically tied to the thing you're building. Uh, I love uh, I, I, I love Tailwind. I didn't think I would before I started, but I tried it and I love it. So uh, what is great about it? It makes it really easy to enforce consistency. So you saw a lot of the stuff that David put out of like primary, secondary colors, uh, shadow one, shadow two, shadow three, all of these things can be translated into variables in JavaScript in an object that you merge with the, the default configuration and makes it really easy to move this stuff around. Uh, I'll probably show a little bit of that uh, when we dig into the code. Um, and then uh, finally, just in terms of like design, I talk about how much I love this like atomic CSS classes, but in order to build a component library where we don't know whether or not the consuming application will have Tailwind installed. I actually have to inline these stuff like these Tailwind atomic styles into things. So I need to fall back on traditional BEM naming conventions to inline these using a directive at apply, which is uh, made available in Tailwind to kind of like take all this, you put it under like dot base button and you apply all the styles that apply to that. Uh, I, you'll, you'll see that when we, we actually like dig into the code. But uh, that is a way of me taking, using all that's great about Tailwind without having to assume that the user has Tailwind. All right, um, in terms of Storybook, like, so what is Storybook? Storybook is a development tool for working uh, with component-based frameworks. It works with React, works with Vue, works with Svelte, works with Ember, works with all those guys, uh, Angular. Um, it allows you to take components, mount them, to build them, mount them in isolation, and kind of define props and focus on building stuff out there. And it's kind of a playground for you to like go in and do that. So you can see here, this is like an example of Storybook where we're able to like go, you can see like we have different props and stuff available. And it's it's essentially like it's it's there, it's for a way for you to define the, the functionality that you want and write the stories, the, the examples of that and then see if it actually works. So when I talk about storybook driven development, this is what I mean. I mean, in the way that test driven development is you write a bunch of tests, they'll, they'll fail at first, but they describe the functionality that you want. And then you write your function and to pass the tests. In the same way that storybook is a way to just think about the properties, the props that you want to make available and the different UI states that you want, you write examples for that and then you start to build the component. And then like as you're working, you can start to visually get feedback on whether or not like your spacing is right. You're like, your CSS is working. Like it's a lot um, in terms of like a test driven development for UI where there, where visual feedback is important. I think, I think it's a pretty important thing. You should still be writing unit tests by the way. And there is, or snapshot tests. And there is that, I'll, I can show some of that. But uh, in terms of like my development flow this is the way that I like to build things now of like thinking about what is this component? What are the different states of the component? Let me write examples of this and then I will, then I will build the component to actually work in storybook. Um, and you, you also saw like the relation between what was in Figma in buttons and what was available as the props that you could toggle around in storybook. So I like pre and post icon, the, the variant, the size and whether it's a block or not, like that is directly represented in Figma and then translated to code. So there's like a one-to-one -one relationship in this case, which makes it really amazing to work with. Yeah, like these these sizes are this these are this is the terminal small, medium, large, giant. These are the terms that David is using. And I've taken them, I put them into enums, and I'm iterating over these enums, right? Like I am setting it down literally in code of like, these are our choices. Um, all right, so let me, yeah, demo time. All right, so ex this, uh, all right. Let me open up actual pollen. Um, so if you go to pollen.bambi.com, feel free, it's out there, it's public. My stance on 
uh, on front end is like, if you really want to reverse engineer stuff, go for it. Like there's, there's nothing hidden on the front end. So like it's up to us in terms of security to not put sensitive stuff out there, but in terms of UI, like it's big wide world. So yeah, let's look at buttons. Um, base. So buttons, we've got, uh, you see, I've, I've got a gallery and like in terms of like how I'm actually programming this, I'm not programming each individual button, right? Like I have a set of, um, color th variants, primary, secondary, tertiary, inverted, and I have a set of sizes, and then I have some other options like block and maybe it's a flat. So like, what does this look like? You can, uh, there's different add-ons in um, Storybook where I can actually look and like, I've just written like a, um, uh, let's see, constants, where are you? Um, so I've got a constants file with button stuff. It's a button enum that has sizes and variants. And I can take those sizes and variants and I can just iterate over them using a, like a V4 size equals sizes, da, da, da. And like, I'm only writing, like this is my gallery code. I'm just writing some like, some iterations over this. And like, I get all possible versions of the button here that I can look at. And as I'm like building a button, I can hit save and, you know, hot reload. I can see all this stuff update in time. Um, and then like I can have specific versions like, okay, I want to be able to add a button before or after. And then, um, oh, label is not defined. Okay, broken thing. Good to know. Eh, still in beta, guys. Um, uh, but yeah, like there's things called knobs uh, in, in here where I can go in and like uh, in Storybook and, you know, like actually interact with a thing. And I can start to see like how like how this all plays out, um, uh, and like ways that I can do this. And you can like go in, you can look at stories. Additionally, so this is like the canvas view. I can go into docs view, and this gives more of like a, a like a more rich documentation of the thing. So I get to see my gallery. But then like I can also see uh, there's a this is automatically generated by the way um, using an add-on in Storybook called docs. Uh, it will look at your your props. And it'll look at the different props you have, and like it'll look at if you've left a JS doc comment in for your props, it'll actually list it here. It'll say the type if you've actually, um, you know, defined the type of your prop, and if there's it's a really default, cool. it'll say where it is. Like I, I don't. Like this is this is a follow-up talk for sure. Oh yeah, like this is all, this is automated. Like as long as you writing documentation in comments in your code, like JS doc, like you know. Yeah, you, you probably should be. Uh, it's just best practice to. It all just gets automatically generated here. Similarly, it'll pick up on any events that get emitted by this component. It'll document that here. I don't know how to actually make this say something other than unknown, but it says like, oh yeah, this component emits the close event. Let me just put that here in its thing. And then like any slots that are in there, it'll list them out, default action descriptions. Uh, and then yeah, it'll just show the other examples here and you can hit show code and you can be like, what is the, actual code I need to output this. If you want, you can go ahead and like copy this and paste this in your, um, uh, in your, in your code. Like we had an example, like the, I think David showed these kind of task cards, uh, right? Like these are, we're getting more into specific UI cases of like features in the app. Um, like this is task card is kind of abstract and it can look like this. It can look like this. Uh, I haven't hooked it up to data. I've just written kind of like examples for this. I don't know what the data shape is ultimately going to look like, but I can start to define what my props and uh, are for this, right? Like, so uh, I didn't, I haven't gotten around this. This is new. So I haven't gotten around to actually writing the documentation that would document the, the comments here. Um, but you can, yeah, you can start to see how this works. And this is one of those like very specific UI component for the app. Uh, but it's a lot easier for me to just build it here and then hand it off to somebody and be like, here you go. I think this is good. Like, let me know if you have anything as opposed to like opening up within the app and trying to build it within the app and like thinking about like global state and all this other stuff. This allows you to kind of isolate out global state, isolate out store and just think about like, what is my interfaces? When you think about like, what are my props, slots and events? These are like, this is the API of my component and how can I make that like simple and consistent? Yeah. Also, um, also show show what the responsive 
view is on the canvas. So I can say I, all that response. Oh, yeah. It's already built in. Yeah. So uh, I can go in, I can hit like there's this small mobile, uh, large mobile, tablet. Uh, and a lot of these, these are a bunch of add-ons that kind of enrich storybooks. So like you can actually go in and, and uh, do all this stuff. I don't know if it, is this guy, I don't remember what this does. Um, yeah, like it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of cool stuff with storybook and it's, yeah, it, it's totally worth its own conversation. Um, uh, but highly recommend it, look into it. It's a great way to like build components and like, it's a good way of thinking about components in a reusable way. Cause when you start thinking outside of the, how do I need, what do I need to build to fix my like feature that I want to build? And you start thinking about like, how do I build a component that can actually be reusable and like picked up, used elsewhere and like doesn't rely on global things. Um, this is a great way to, to do this in isolation. Um, yes, yeah, so that's storybook. Let me, oops, uh, reshare a different screen here. Do, 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 do. Uh, all right. Oops, not that, I want present. All right, so that's storybook. Um, talked about Netlify, GitHub Actions, uh, try to automate as much stuff as possible. So pollen.bambi.com is the build of storybook itself that just it's there it's living documentation so that i can point to other like point other people to be that and like here's this new component i built you can look at the docs and know how to use it um that builds anytime i push to master uh netlify is awesome it creates deploy previews so when i'm like i just built this new component i can be like david here's a link can you check this out? Let me know if I need to make any changes, especially now that we're in like COVID state. It's a lot easier to be able to like lean over his shoulder and be like, Hey man, does this look right? We don't have that. It's a little bit harder. There's been times when there was times when we were playing with animation where we needed like even faster. So we were using code pen to be like going back and forth on like easing curves and animation durations. But for the most part, I can be like deploy preview. Let me know what you, if there's any changes, comment, cool, I'll make the changes and then push and merge. And then once I merge into master, I can tag a release in GitHub and that'll trigger an automatic deploy using GitHub Actions. So that'll actually like run our integration tests or our unit tests, uh, make sure everything's good. If that's all good, it'll build the production bundle, you know, separate from not the, not the pollen.bambi.com public storybook site, but it'll actually build the production bundle for the thing and deploy that out to net and PM. Um, yeah, and that that's kind of like the 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 high overview of the tooling. We'll go into like the actual code in a, a bit, time permitting. But uh, I just want to go over like some tips and tricks. Uh, David, I don't know if you want to talk about Figma tips and tricks. Yeah, like, I mean, like if you're if you're building a design system, like one of there's uh, there's it, it works in both Sketch and Figma. Like it's slash based naming. So like every time you put a slash, you're creating a new division or a new page or a new nest. Like don't use that too much. Like there's actually no need to do it. Like you, you can rely on like in, intel, intelligent. That's like your human intelligence, uh, top level naming to make it really much easier to, to select the right component and select the right state at the component. And also one really great thing about Figma is like copying groups of components. So you saw I had uh, primitives and the regular components copying that whole group into another file actually maintains the links between those primitives and the actual components, which makes it really easy to move stuff around. So it's like, oh, I, I built this thing in this file, but I actually want to move it into my design system or whatever. Uh, it, it, Figma does a really great job of, job of not screwing you over. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then in terms of like dev tips and tricks, uh, I'm, all about like removing friction and automating stuff as much as possible. So if you can hit save and it will lint and prettyify and like format your code, that's that's everything. So use ES lint, use prettier, figure out what your defaults are. We're using Airbnb plus uh, like view recommended, um, which lines up pretty much with the rest of our, our code base. Um, but like, ideally you don't have to think about this stuff. It just fixes itself. Um, and then code, like that style consistency, code consistency. I use enums and constants all over the place. Like David has done a really thorough job of thinking about like, again, we get back to choice, eliminating choice. Like let's, let's put some walls down. What are our variants? We've got small, medium, large, giant, whatever, like 
cool. I'm going to take that. I'm going to put it in an enum. And then I'm going to, in, in view, when you define props, you can define the type they are. You can define if they're the default and if they're required. And you can also define a validator function to say if the val they'll throw a warning if the value that you pass in as a prop is not valid. So what does that mean? That means like I'm going to run my validator function, make sure whatever value came in actually exists within that enum. Um, you know, it won't break the thing. It'll just throw a warning in console. It'll be like that's not a valid, you know, valid value. Um, so you know why like something didn't work out right. But it's just like a uh, like make I've got enums everywhere, uh, and then like I can expose those in uh, the public package so that if people want to actually like go off of that, uh, it's great. And also like your depending on your IDE, VS Code picks up on that. And it can like do an IntelliSense autocomplete of like you type button dot sizes and it's like oh here are the options for button dot sizes um, cool uh, other things um, slots are awesome uh, use them there's a people who are coming from a React world tend to like push everything into props and passing props down including passing components down via props uh, in view. If you want to pass components down, you use slots for that. Don't try and pass a component down as a prop. I mean, you can, but like that's not, it's inelegant and not really the way to go about doing things. Use use slots. That is one of the strengths of Vue that uh, is different from React. Can I, uh, can I, can we just finish this list, but I'd like to like go through and just like see the enums in action and like what that Oh yeah, oh yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll show them. Uh, all right, uh, other than that, um, Functional components. I gave a talk a long, long time ago. I don't think it was recorded here, but I gave a talk on functional components in Vue and like why they're good for performance. Um, if you don't know what they are, don't overthink it, but look it up. Get to learn them. They're fun and they will make your application run faster. It's an optimization that you should definitely go over there. And finally, like collaboration. Um, it, it's, it's just me and David working on this together and it really, like you can be really productive uh, when it's like two people that know what they're doing and like have a good communication. So um, if you can do that, great tip. So let me go ahead and sh uh, close this and like, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll do some code splunking. I will open this up uh, for, don't wanna go too long. We're nearly at uh, time here, but uh, do you guys see that orange looking VS code? Is that sharing? Yeah, scroll a bit over. You see is that there we go. all right let me close this let me let me i've got too many things open sorry i'm actively working on the thing uh all right so we talked about avatars a little bit let me uh all right let me open up uh avatars so uh also let me i don't know it's not even running all right, let me close this. It's a little bigger here. John, it's okay if you go a little long. And uh, I was gonna suggest, aside from just showing us the avatar, I liked how you would, I just want to remember from the code, like you'd kind of like create like a, like a, like a base item and you, and you, and you, oh, you yeah. know, built oh, upon yeah. that and like walk us through how you, you just pick, pick a component, something as simple as a checkbox seems like. Yeah, okay, well, let's, so yeah, system. let's start with user avatar in general. I'll break that down. So. Let's start high level here of how I've organized this project. Maybe I make this, I make this bigger. Great. Okay. Uh, all right. So pollen. Let me collapse this. All right. So what we've got here, source. That's that's all the stuff. Um, and this is all available if you want to look at Bambi HR slash pollen on GitHub. That is us. That is this. It's all. Open. Um, all right, cool. That is loading. All right, so how am I organizing this? So we've got uh, in source, we've got our, uh, we've got some assets that is mostly SVG icons that we're using. Uh, we've got our components that is the bread and butter. We've got our constants. Uh, I'll, uh, sh yeah, I'll show that off in a bit. Uh, and then we've got some tailwind stuff. And we've got some utility functions. These are just like logical functions that I can like abbreviate number, get attributes, stuff that I can like easily. They're, they're just utility functions. So you'll net, you'll notice here I've got like the utility function, and then I have a test for it, and then I've got so 
we're we're writing test guys this is like 90 90 91 percent test coverage in pollen uh we can probably get higher on that um so yeah uh a few of them are missing but like for the most part we've got these are just utility functions that do a thing all right so our components let's look at let's look at buttons buttons are good um so we've got our base button here Within components slash base button, we've got base button dot view. That's the component. We've got base button dot stories dot js. So when I uh, this base button dot stories js is actually what will populate um, our buttons base button right here. So we've got base button gallery with pre icon with post icon with knobs. If I go into base button stories, you can see I've got buttons slash base buttons buttons slash base buttons. Uh, it's about base buttons, and then we've got like our gallery story, our pre-icon story, post-icon story with knobs, and all Sean, of these. There's, just, there's so many like different squares around. It's hard to hard to kind of the context of the code. Is there a way to get rid of the the terminal in the bottom there and maybe make the make the oh, yeah. a little smaller? Uh, or, or... Yeah, let me minimize this guy. There we go. All right, so. Um, and then within within Storybook, these stories, these stories should look pretty familiar. These are really just view components, right? I've got components, some data, some methods, and then a template. I'm not using like these aren't view, dot view single file components, uh, but I can still write like a template and then just write a template string that'll kind of describe what the what the thing itself is. Looks a little simpler if we look at with pre icon, right? Like this is just a view component. That is, that is being displayed up here. And then if I look at the knobs, there's actually like a import Boolean select text from this add-on knobs. And I can go on and I can uh, define like, I've got my props, I've got these different knobs that I'm defining here. So like text. Could you go a little slower? Cause you can see it, but we have to oh, sure, zoom in on it a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, all right. so. Okay, again, I'm like, Storybook has add-on knobs. I'm taking from that some, like, Boolean select text. These are all controls knob types that I want. And if you look at with knobs, I've got, this is a select, right? This is select, this is text, and then these are, these are Booleans. Oh, well, interesting. I, yeah, okay. Um, See, I'm like, why did that break? Now, now I have to be like, is there a bug? Anyways, um, all right. So, uh, Boolean select text, and then, uh, you know, I can write a base component, or if I want to start using knobs to actually like populate this stuff, I can do that here, where I'll be like, uh, a, I can define some props. I can do, define the default for these props, and I can have label submit. So, label this defaults as submit. These are like our like our options, our default. Um, can go really deep into this if I wanted to, if we had time. But like, basically, like it's it's pretty easy to build out the stories because they're really just view components. John, right, can, so I, can I ask you? Is there a reason that you guys go with the uh, the, the template if you scroll down? Uh, that's that, because yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's because I'm writing stories in JavaScript files as opposed to I could write another like base dot button dot stories dot view component but that's a dot view component and i could import that component into a story but like stories are javascript and so that's and like whereas a dot view file is a single file component that needs to go through webpack and get like turned into a thing so like i'm just trying to like simplify my life here and say like i want to put all my stories in a stories.js file got it yeah. But so when you're looking at the base button, can we look at it for a sec? Is it identical? The, is it just uh, uh, base button is tricky because base button is actually a functional component. You'll notice there is no so template. Here. Maybe that's where. Maybe that's where I was trying. I was trying to find a. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so <laughs> yeah, you've got. It this all is where we talk with when I, when I talk about like um, advanced knowledge of of the framework and how, how understanding how things are. So. Base button is one of those ones, there's buttons everywhere. I'm gonna optimize it and make sure it works really well. So I'm actually using a functional component in Vue and I'm not using a template, I'm directly using the render function within Vue. So like, 
uh, I talked a little bit in my uh, former talk about like what really is a component in React and Vue. Like these are essentially like render functions that return a virtual node that describes uh, a DOM element. But like these are like this is a description of DOM element. It's not actually a DOM element. And like in Vue, we can abstract that higher from a a a render function that returns a DOM element into a template. The template gets turned into a render function that then returns a virtual node. Like this might be way over everyone's heads here, but like that is it. That is essentially what a template is. A template is an abstracted render function. So if you want to get closer to like the meat, the metal of building a component, then you can actually directly access the render function. And if you are a React person that likes React, you can actually use JSX within a render function. So you can see here, I'm actually composing, like I've got a pre-icon. If there is a prop for the pre-icon, then I will return this base icon component. Otherwise, I'm going to return null, right? Pre-icon, post-icon, I can start to look at this. I can then actually return my, uh, like th this is a render proper render function using create element. So I'm going to return uh, a component that is going to be props.tag, tag being a prop that defaults to button. So we assume it's a button. These are my attributes and props that will be passed to that component. And uh, the third argument is the children of that component. So maybe button was a weird one for me to pick as a first one. This, this is like advanced functional component stuff. Uh, here, this is what I was most curious about because I saw this before, and um, could that be written in the, like a template section, or is uh, or yeah, it's just too complicated? Let me find a. I mean, it, it's kind of a like it depends on how you want to write it, and like uh, it it can be though. Buttons are like buttons specifically are complex because there's a lot of like they're used everywhere. You want to make sure you handle all the cases and like functional components. There's a lot more like manual work you have to do. It's one of those like I'd recommend reading up on, on functional components before you start using them, but I do recommend using them and learning about them. Let's look at a something a little simpler. Like I think. Uh, uh, by the way, I, 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 I almost like this is like the meat of a lot of what I wanted to see. So, let, so if you're up for it, let's just keep going for a bit. But uh, all right. You know, this, uh, is the, this is this is uh, this is great stuff. I don't want to. I don't want to artificially cut it. Sure. Off. All right. So uh, here is base divider. What is like so base divider? We um, we just show you what that is first, so we know what we're talking about. So a divider, like we're talking about a horizontal rule or vertical rule that can optionally have a label inside of it. All right. Um, uh, so what does that actually look like in here? Uh, let's just look at the props that we're accepting. Whether it's dashed. What the, if there's a label and whether it's vertical. So that those are our props. Um, and then I've got some like simple styles. Oh yeah, so uh, I talked about styles and how much I liked um, Tailwind. So in Tailwind, if I was normally building this, I would take these classes and I'd just put them right here and I wouldn't even bother with base divider. Like I'd just do that. But since this is a library that I wanna make portable and exposed to other people, um, and other apps that might not be using Tailwind, I need to actually like take those classes, put them behind like a whatever BEM, I'm just using BEM naming convention here, and I will apply these Tailwind classes within. All right, um, cool. So there's that. Um, I'm making this a functional component by, oops, ah, what the heck is that? Base divider. All right, I'm making this a functional component by just saying it's functional right here in template. And that means it's going to behave a little bit differently. So there is no this in a functional component. Uh, if you've done React, uh, it's a dumb component, stateless component, functional component that like that. That is what this is. It is a, uh, there is no local state, there's no this. So things are like, uh, a little different and it's this is one of the things that isn't greatly documented in view uh, but it, the benefit here is that like you're actually like because it's a functional component without local state you're not instantiating a new object so there's some memory gains here and if you have a lot of like buttons or dividers or a lot of these like little things that show up everywhere i'd 
angle towards using functional components just for performance's sake. All right. So, so basically, if I, I mean, I'm imagining almost that normally it, it would render the template and then you have to like essentially override that. Whereas this is basically saying, hold up, don't render the template. Here's the, here's the or final version and then it renders. Uh, no, it's more like, no, like a functional component is like, I don't really like any time that there, that things re-render, it has no kind of memory of where it was. It will just re-render. Whereas like a normal component will kind of be smart about it and be like, okay, data has changed. What has changed? Let me take a look here and see like, let me look at what the result of normally rendering would be. Okay, like that just changes a single button within here. So let me run a diff on the, virtu on the VDOM, virtual DOM to be like, okay, I need to only make this change to this and subchildren of this. Whereas a uh, functional component is like, I don't care. Like I'm not thinking that hard. I, the, just here's my output. Yeah, I got I got like a class like in React, like a class based component is actually gonna take up some amount what will be a small amount of memory that, to to handle the state, whether it exists or not, a functional component is just gonna go. Yeah. And that's what this is. Like where and like uh it's it's definitely like in uh yeah, this is an optimization, this is like more advanced uh view stuff, which is different from React. Like in React almost everything is written as functional components these days um for better or worse um but it, it's less so the way that we do things in view but you'll notice like if i'm using a functional component i actually need to access props dot dashed as opposed to just dashed since there is no this um also like data parent these are things like i have a helper function get attributes that like does some additional kind of like combining of parent data attributes for scope styles and all that um here um and then like i want to transparently pass down any listeners that are on here i have to manually do this in a functional component versus mm -hmm. a standard component view will just handle any listeners that are attached to the component uh, itself but here i'm manually passing it down um and all this is basically because view is not trying to do as little thinking about functional components as possible making them efficient um yeah, so that's that's that. Uh, let me talk about like so enums. Let's look at so the the chips the uh, no the not the chips the other one tags. So these are good. So tags we've got a nice like gallery of colors and sizes. Let's look at base tag here. Um, if we look at this, this could actually honestly be a functional component too. I don't know why it's not. Um, I've defined. Uh, so I've localized some some colors or some sizes and colors and this, i this by the I, way feels the most readable that's why i mean maybe it's because i'm not as used to the functional but like i think it's very clear if, you, if we look if we could start off looking at the template at the top sure yeah basically just defining what gets passed yeah. in all the base tag things. base tag with color base tag with size and whether or not it's an outline so we're like right, like size color whether or not it's an outline perfect right very, like, very readable you go in you look at the docs and like color, outline, size, and then there's a default slot that is that content, right? So, um, all right. So how do I generate all that, right? So like, I'm first, I'm gonna figure out some sizes. Um, so I'm, you know, here, small, medium, large. I'm gonna set that up in an enum. In JavaScript, JavaScript alone doesn't have enums. TypeScript does, but if I want to like make an object whose children is, are immutable like sizes will never change, then I can wrap it in object free. So that's what that is. Hmm. This is how to do an enum in, in vanilla JavaScript. <clears throat> um, it, if I were to use these sizes across different things, and this is like a architecture thing where I'm, I actually probably will take this and move it out to like general generic sizes, because we use small, medium, large all over the place. Uh, but I would probably take that and I would extract this out and move it to this constants folder here. So I already have like some alert button form constants, but I'd probably take like a like sizes and just drop that into, I already have like a button sizes constants, like these look familiar. So, you know, that's a refactor thing that I'll probably approach. So these are my known sizes. I also have colors. So I've got black and gray and also this extended palette. So that should sound familiar from what David was showing earlier. He said that here's our extended palette of fancy colors. And this is coming from um tailwind theme i'll get into that in a second but um so Did you i guys might write that theme 
or is that yes we wrote we, okay so tailwind is very extensible so you can kind of you know mod, like create a settings json that you can merge with this tailwind theme so like it's you know in, instead of writing a bunch of sas variables i'm just writing a json object that i merge in cool all right, so here we've got our like our props, color, outline, size. You'll notice I'm just writing some like pretty simple JS doc here, and like you know you can see this one of the extended color palette names. If we look here, it's one of the extended color palette names, like automatically generated uh, thanks to Storybook. Um, I'm, I've got my validator function here saying I only want colors that you know the color value must actually be part of colors. Um, and uh, and then I've got my styles, uh, and these are like applied Tailwind styles. All right, so let's talk about Tailwind a little bit. Um, so Tailwind has a bunch of kind of defaults. Uh, if you go to Tailwind CSS, so you saw this. There's like BG white, background white. What if I want BG red? Well, can I edit this? If I were to type BG dash red, red is actually a default color in Tailwind, so that background would turn red. But like what red? Let me define what my red is. So uh, if you actually, you can go in. Uh, let's let's just look at colors, customization, themes. If uh, color, all right, colors. Oops. So you can see there's a Tailwind config JS file. You can actually go in and like theme colors. You can define what your colors are here, right? So let's look at our look at our our Tailwind config JS. Um, Tailwind config JS. I'm here. Tailwind config JS uh, runs in Node. That's why we're using requires. But uh, I'm requiring our source Tailwind theme. Uh, I've also got a typography plugin that just like combines a bunch of the styles to do all of the rich typography stuff. Like, feel free to poke around that. I'm not going to talk about it. But I'm taking the theme. I'm um, kind of pulling out inset spacing, transition duration from the theme, and, and then just the rest of the stuff. And I can either like overwrite the values or I can extend the values. Um, so you know, I'm, I'm overwriting a lot of stuff and I'm extending a few things because like for the most part, transition, spacing, duration, they're all right. I'm, I'm not going to mess with that. All right, so like let's look at, let's look at the uh, Tailwind theme and just see where that is. Do, do, do. So Tailwind theme. All right, this in the end, let me just, okay. So you guys took Tailwind and basically like wrote out your own, your own kind of set, your theme basically. Yeah, so like we so looked at the box right. shadows that, that David brought up, right? He had like six different version of box shadows. So I just went, I wrote box shadow one, two, three, four, five, six, and like, pretty much copied his styles that he defined in box shadow and pasted them here. Um, and uh, you can look at box shadow. If you look at the official docs, you can go in and be like, you can see these are their defaults, but I'm not using any of like, these guys. I want like sh not shadow XS, I want shadow one, shadow two, shadow three. So I'm overwriting that uh, to give us different results. Now, if I'm in base tag and I want to drop a shadow on this, I can just go box shadow. Uh, is it shadow? Shadow. Shadow one. And you'll see this is nice in VS Code. I've got an autocomplete IntelliSense here. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, nice. that's an extension. And I can see, like, here are all my different shadow options and, you know, like what this will actually do for me, right? Similarly, I can go, uh, like, uh, I can say text primary, and I can. What is that? Excuse me. What's that plugin that you think? Uh, so I'm I'm using Visual Studio Code, and the plugin is uh, I think it's just Tailwind. Um, yeah, oh. or extension. Yeah, it's the Tailwind extension. So it'll pick up on your config file, even if your config file is like importing stuff from another file. Um, it'll it'll pick up on that and know how to like actually populate this stuff for you. So now like this is super handy for people because it's like, I don't, what are the, what's, what is that color name again? I don't know. Like, is it, is it puce? Is it like, uh, you know, like two bros? Well, I can see that they're all here now and I can actually like pick this up. And like, if I look in Figma, 
these names are consistent. So if I like look, open up Figma and I'm like, what color is this? I can see that this is specifically like text gray five, right? And I can know to use text gray five. Um, uh, so like consistency of language is all, all enforced here. Uh, it all kind of falls back on this theme file. So I've got like my colors. So I have a primary, I can have primary dash shade dash two, primary dash shade dash one. All right, so if I let me open up another All right text primary shade one or background primary shade two, like that all maps to color primary shade two, primary tint one. Uh, and then I've got my extended palette, which um, extended palette. So got an extended palette here. These are our fancy colors. Guys, they're two bros, inevitable fun names. I'll export that module as a, a node module, but I will also use that within my um, theme object, extend that here. Uh, but the point, the point of this all is theme.js is exported. If I'm use, if I have a project that's using Tailwind, I can import theme.js, merge that in with my Tailwind config, and now I have access to all of our settings. And like I can start to build stuff in Tailwind consistent with our brand. Um, so yeah, that, like all this stuff is here. You know, anything that I don't overwrite, Tailwind's defaults work. Like I don't need to overwrite Tailwind's block and inline block styles. Like those are those are great. I have no reason to change that. So those will continue to work. Um, uh, but yeah, that's that's all here. Um, so that is uh, that that is like. The, the autocomplete is like totally one of the, the, the best things. If you're going to work in Tailwind, that's great. Additionally, if we, because we've started to like, because I put stuff like, um, like buttons, my sizes and my variants, right? Like uh, VS Code should be able to pick up on this as well. So button.variants. Primary, secondary, tertiary, like all these things will be picked up in IntelliSense. As I'm coding, I know what my options are. Like they, they should be made, they should be exposed. So these are all like just really nice practices. If you define that, if you, if you define what your variants are, then you can, as an enum, as opposed to just a free floating string, then you can refer to these. Um, and like I will export these constants as well if people want to use the enums. They can use strings as well. Enums are just strings in the end, but like it's all it's all there. Um, cool. So that's uh, it's a ton of info, and like <laughs> could go on forever. But like that's uh, I think uh, covers most of the thinking that was involved in, in this. Like otherwise, it's just a bunch of like one, one, once that gets down, I, I, it's just a bunch of copy and paste. When I make a new component, I'm like cool like. A lot of my, my tests are snapshot tests. So snapshot test is just like, it takes, it'll like you mount the component and then like it'll save the HTML for that rendered component and the test will fail if the HTML changes. And honestly, for the most part, like for UI components, that's all I need to know. Did anything change? Uh, the next step would be to do like a visual regression test, uh, snapshot test, um, but like that's next step. That's later when I have time to to do that, but like, um, you know, th this will cover things and then you can add additional functionality tests, uh, unit tests on top of that, depending on what the component is. But at the very least, I'm going to be writing a snapshot test for everything. Very cool. Can I, can I ask you one more or less kind of thing to just have as, a, as an example, so I'd, I'd have to look here before, before we wrap up. Um, check boxes, for example, I'd seen that you would, uh, you kind of, again, like show us the, how you did the, check boxes like the base and like that i feel like there were like numerous oh layers. yeah there was okay like so check boxes are this fun. this all right like so a, check boxes let's talk about what, what is a check box uh it's a check box and a radio uh, button are very similar things a check box is just a multi-select and a radio button is a single select out of a group of selections uh where did it select in yeah that's kind of why i wanted it was interesting that you had decided to kind yeah, of yes so i just call to share the base together yeah like uh, honestly like so i've built uh this i didn't like i've built checkboxes radio groups 
checkbox groups and radio groups in the past, uh, both from scratch. But uh, when I was working for Elizabeth Warren, I was building out a different UI component in React. I found, and I just found that I like I was copying and pasting most of the code. The slight difference was in the interface of like, okay, a, a select group or a, like a checkbox group is a multi-select. So it's actually like we'll accept an array of values versus a radio group which accepts a single value. That was the only difference. Uh, yeah. more or less. So like that and like a visual element. So like let's abstract out the visual element and let's abstract out that logic of multi-select versus single select. Um, anyways, really quick, this is what they look like. Uh, you can see that they've got different like label on the left. That's checkbox. Uh, here's a singular checkbox. Um, and then here's a radio group. They look all pretty similar. Uh, also, like a radio toggle is essentially. This is also a radio radio group, but it really I have is. I have a question when when you're done. Sure. Oh. I just joined, and I wasn't sure. First of all, if anyone could hear me, I this is the second time I've been on the VOIP with other programmers in my life. So forgive me for that. I just wanted to make sure. And my name's Joseph. It's nice to meet you guys. Hey. Hey. Uh, sorry, did you have a question or just introing? Oh, I, I wanted to intro. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, this welcome. Is like, this is like the third one I've done, and I'm, I'm not trying to bitch or anything like that. I, I'm really excited about being able to talk with other programmers, but I'm not learning anything. <laughs> I haven't learned one thing today, but that's cool. I've, I've done a lot of JavaScript, like 10 years of just intense study, really, off and on. But, um, so nice. anyway, cool. I'm going, I'm going to be in here, and I would be happy to help anybody with any project. Like I'm, that's what I'm about right now, and I've I've, I've done a lot of studying. Like I said, so, okay, Great. introduction complete. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, sorry. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah. Anyways, radio toggles basically radio groups, radio checkboxes under the hood. That's what they are. Um, and then like these switches, which again are just like these are essentially just checkboxes. Um, under the hood, they're either checkboxes or they're radio boxes or radio buttons, like same thing. Uh, a lot of that functionality, like that logic is the same. How do I actually break that out to make it reusable? So um, I've, for the most part, like these are all public mm -hmm. components. There's some things that are internal components that I wanted to use here. So I've got our toggle. Um, at the very base, there's a toggle input, whether or not it's a radio or a checkbox is a, that is just a, that's a prop, it's a type. Uh, these are like, again, these are like internal for me. I'm not exposing this out. There's no, to toggle input is not a public um, thing to be used by other people. Um, and that's so, but uh, a toggle group is just a bunch of toggle Wait, input. Wait, say No, I mean like, sorry. In terms of like when I, when we're building out the component library, like I'm building out components for people to use. However, like that is me establishing a contract of like, these are the components, these are the props, these are the like expected naming conventions and all that. I will try and maintain that as much as possible and not make breaking changes for that. However, under the hood, maybe there's other sub child components that I'm using internally that I'll put in the internal bucket. And maybe I don't even want to like, I'm, I might not necessarily even be writing tests for these things. I just want them, like, what, I may or may not, whatever. Like, I'm holding it to a different coding standard. The props for these internal components, I can change willy-nilly, right? Like, these are private in the terms of, like, don't rely on this. Things can break. I take no responsibility for you. If you happen to want to pull out the toggle input component and use that primitive, like, that is, I, I have no, I will not support that. Don't do that. That's for me, right? Like okay. that's what I mean by by internal and private. Anyway, so like that, like, but the the point is like these are pretty like the logic for whether or not it's a checkbox or radio group will be fairly similar, or like checkbox or radio button individual. It'll be focused. It'll be checked. It'll be whatever. Like this is reusable logic. Uh, where we start to diverge is like it's a toggle group. It's a group of components, and then whether or not it's a checkbox radio or switch in, will indicate whether or not it's a like the, the value prop should be an array or whether it should be an individual value right so if I look to value it's going to be either a string or an array right so, so you're 
in the like at the top level, you're using just the word input and passing in type radio, or I don't know what your three were, but uh, I mean, I'd say yeah, the yeah, yeah. So like at the at the well, at the top level, you're not passing that. At the top level, you are using radio input, a radio group. Okay. What constitutes a radio group is a toggle group of toggle inputs. And within radio group, I am defining type radio, right? But yeah. in terms of like you, the outward facing API, you don't worry about that stuff. You worry right. about giving me a single value and a, an array of options. I just think it's really nice that you're kind of like reusing that. Yeah, a, so that's like, a, yeah, there's a lot of like code reusability way. here, but it's a matter of like, what is the, where, do, where does the fork in logic actually happen? And let me reuse code up until that fork and then let me make you component A and component B that covers both forks so that I can eliminate, you don't need to worry about the type prop. I worry about the type prop and I've eliminated choice again of like, this, is, this comes in the, the wrapper of like, let me give you component A, component B. They're both, uh, you know, derivatives of component C, but don't use component C, use these two. So, yeah. Got it. Cool. Cool. All right. All right. So, uh, view, view.js is a component library then that's what it is no view.js is a ui framework or uh, is a dom manipulation uh framework okay okay yeah, I remember similar to react so oh, interesting yeah. yes, that, that, that's, that, that's, a, that's a conversation for another day guys because we're running out <laughs> of minutes late so um i think i'm gonna cool. use that john was there any other last thought that you had that you were going to go with uh, no, I just hope, hopefully uh, other folks have learned some few, a few things today. There's a, you know, uh, this is one of those like, oh, yeah, one other thing. So I mentioned like this is out, it's public, it's open source. I don't expect people to use it, but it's there as kind of a resource for people to reference and like, you know, uh, for me to point to is like, here's what I have come around to thinking are like good coding practices. Um, and you know, I'm all about like spreading knowledge for this stuff. So uh, ideally, you know, uh, folks can look at it and learn something or point out stuff that I did wrong and be like, that's silly and can help me get better at that. But, uh, you know, I just like, it's really just like a resource for people to like, for, for us to just show off how to do things in a way that I think is good. Yeah, I'm, I'm ha also happy to share our master Figma files with anybody. Like if you just want to dive into it and, and, and play with something that's already built. Yeah, actually, David, I had a question about that. In regards to Figma and I guess this ability to like export, um, like is it is it like Sketch where there are files that you can literally export or like yeah, that work? I can I can export a dot fig um, that anybody can import into their into their Figma, whether it be through the browser or through uh, the, the the desktop desktop wrapper of that, um, but it will it will so I can import each each library as its own individual file, or you have, like, whether those things stay in link when imported together is yet to be seen. Um, but uh, because I've done most things in one file, I, mean, you, you'll get, I can I can send that that file when you get the, the the vast majority of the benefit. Gotcha, gotcha. And then um, I, I guess in regards to Figma, like are there any like other like open, like open or publicly available like Figma examples? That thousands, people thousands, can take thousands, thousands, thousands. I, if the you, one that you would choose and recommend. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, uh, I would have to do uh, a, a little more over research search before I actually recommended a design system, but I can tell you that in the Figma community, Spotify has a ton of incredible resources that start at the very top um, from just like how they manage design all the way to their actual design systems. So, you know, like, you know, one, one, of, one of the things we called that earlier is like, like using pre-existing or pre-rolled frameworks is a great way to learn what not to do. And I think like that's actually like one of the most important lessons of 
of all of this stuff is like dive into stuff and see how other people do it and then learn your own way to do it yourself. Um, that's how I essentially learned everything is by taking apart other people's code. Uh, a lot of it very good, uh, a lot of it very bad. Um, but the, like, the only way you really learn is to, is to be like, well, how the fuck, why did you do that? Or I, why, why did you do that? Like, it is, it's, it's, it's lear learn, learning through doing is, I think, the most important uh, takeaway to all of this. I do have to say that that was kind of the fun part of seeing uh, both your code um, is the getting a sense of how you guys thought about it and how you broke, broke down the problem. Uh, that was super interesting. Um, you know, I mean, just, just again, just looking through the different le levels, I wouldn't necessarily have thought of doing that. I would have just created a button that takes a billion props. But the fact that you have like a, a base button that you then wrap, you know, another layer on top of and kind of organize that way, or the fact that you did the inputs totally makes sense because I've dealt with it that, you know, again, all the 10 different variations of toggles, that's just UI, but it's basically choose one or choose many. And then, uh, and then uh, that logic can all be extracted out. Um, but anyway, that was really, it's interesting to see that you guys, you know, how you guys organize that. Yeah, yeah like I have this, am I still showing screen? I am still showing yeah, screen. Yeah, yeah, I've got this like, yeah. these, t this toggles folder here, check the box indicator radio. They're like, these are all, these are purely <laughs> just like, uh, like UI, like is it on or is it off? And like, what are the styles involved with like it on or off or disabled, mm -hmm. yep. right? Like, it's all just visual stuff. Uh, and it, then like, it, it, depending it, on what type it is, that changes out what toggle we're using. But otherwise the, the, remain, the other logic is more or less the same. It, it, takes, it takes screwing up a number of times. Yeah. I mean, you're really never done screwing up, but it, it, that, it, like that, for, for me, at least personally, has it, it, been the biggest driver of learning. It's like, oh, that's clearly not the way to do it, the way that I did it and now have to deal with yeah. it over and over and over again. Yeah, like these, the, this toggle input, like breaking up logic, I, I like literally stole from the last project I was working on. And there's a bunch of like these, like these functional components, icon button components, I'm also stole from like joy mode, where I was at two positions there, high, high Elvis. Um, uh, like, uh, like I, I'm, re I'm reusing code shamelessly. And that's another reason I'm like, I'm happy to put this stuff out, open source, take a look at it. I'm like, we're all like, I'm le I've learned from other people um, by looking at their examples. Hopefully people can learn stuff from, from this and uh, you know, like we can contribute to like, continue to contribute back to the community. Um, yeah, and I'd say that kind of both you guys, first of all, thank you both so much. Super interesting. Um, I did not expect us to cover, I mean, you guys gave us like, not just like the component library, but like so much of the tooling around that you guys built. And like, I mean, just the shorthand, you guys, the way you guys must speak to each other is freaking amazing. Um, and so uh, I, mean, I almost feel like there's like numerous, <laughs> what's that? We speak to each other a lot less because like, it, there's like a, there's like a shared, a shared knowledge, which is like, which is super efficient. Yeah, um, like I don't have to ask as many questions because it's it's there, it's in the documentation of like, and it's like done with intention, right? Like I can see you've reused this typography. Like it's not, this isn't, I don't have to question like, oh, is this like a mistake? Did you like nudge a pixel wrong? Like, no, no, you're actually reusing that same component from elsewhere, so. The ability to work with people on a team <laughs> that you guys are just like in flow together like that, there's nothing like that. That's just such a good feeling, that's great. Um. And I just like I just and just looking at this, I feel like there's like you know two more talks at least, meaning like two different directions of talks I could think about. And I'm not I'm not I'm always like asking for more talks, which that's a different conversation. But I just say like that I feel like there's like way deeper in all the different tools, like a talk on Figma, a talk on Storybook, et cetera, et cetera. And then separately, like I just you know I would love to just do even like more like spelunking on pollen alone, like just like the step by step of every single component why you, you know, like, let's talk about what belongs in a base and what belongs on top of that, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, yes. you know, again, it just, it's really, really neat to, uh, I feel like, I feel like there's like definitely more talks I might ask both of you to do on both of those. Cause, uh, yeah. I feel like there's more and more here. We'll wait, we'll wait for, I'm sure you guys are on version 0.8. When we get to 0.9, it'll be point release that you guys can, uh, I mean, it's still 0.0. X at the moment. I know yeah. whatever number you're at. I was saying whatever incremental uh, update there is, maybe that'll be a time for me to say like let's let's talk about pollen some more because uh, it's really cool seeing something like this get built from the ground up. It's really really neat. Um, 
And again, just like all the tooling in there that you guys just like, you know, really know how to speak to each other kind of through those tools too is really cool. I'm curious what those tests, what um, were you just writing? Those tests look really odd. Oh, uh, yeah, the snapshot tests. Is that what you're asking about? Um, were those snapshot tests? Are there snapshot, but then the other ones? Uh, yeah, I mean, so for the most part, I'm writing snapshot tests, and all the snapshot tests is I'm saying, like, take this component, import component button, feed it some default props, and then, like, output whatever the output HTML is, save that to a uh, <laughs> snapshot file, dot snap dot whatever HTML or something. I don't know what um, that is. Is that, that I'm assuming that takes a visual snapshot for, the, for people to look at? It takes a structural snapshot. So there, there are visual snapshots. And what I'm doing is using Jest, which is a test runner, automated test runner, to oh, okay. say, like, take the outputted HTML that is a result of mounting this component with these props, save that to an HTML file. If, that, if in future renderings, the HTML changes, the test fails, and you have to mm. go in and manually approve, like, oh, no, I intended this to change. This test, I, I, I will now I approve. That sounds a lot more lightweight than, uh, like, a Percy snapshot, like a visual. Regression. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it runs pretty fast. And, that, like, that's part of the goal. It's like, we want to be able to run these tests any time that, like, any continuous integration, right? Anytime I'm so change. sorry to ask you this and, and bother you with it, but I that's something I'd really like to know about. For all the lack of knowledge I do have, that's like definitely one of the things on my forefront is testing. Sorry about all the noise. I'm about to stop here. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I like it, that. That is a topic in and all of itself. But yeah, like from a, issue. you know, from a UI perspective, from, from someone who works on the UI like front end, that is at the very least, I think like what you should be writing test coverage for is just like knowing whether or not something changes, like a structural. HTML snapshot. So can you whether give or not me an example of like what would change and what would that would look like? I'm so sorry because I've never actually seen this. I, I just I, I have to be the one to be the bad guy here and cut us off. We are literally 35 minutes late, and I actually I'm I'm hosting this, but I have a meeting I have to be at five minutes ago. So oh, no. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna have to end the room right now. You can jump in. Uh, I can't even. I don't know who spoke right there. Whoever that was, come join us again next month. Uh, you joined like literally towards the end of the meetup, so. I know. I, I spent a lot of time going long uh, around. <laughs> anyway, uh, first of all, everyone, David, John, thank you so much. Everyone, unmute for a sec so I can actually hear your clapping. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys so much. Thank that was a you. great talk. I feel like there was so much there. Honestly, that could have easily turned into a, a, a day of just like you guys teaching the world how to build a framework.